Yeah, thank you, Martin, and uh, thank you, thank you all for staying so late in the afternoon. It's the last presentation, and I will jump in scale to my uh, to to the speaker before me. We will talk about the neighborhood, even down to the scale of the building, which is very far from uh, what I studied, but is the environment now that I uh, find myself in uh, day to day. But back to this little afternoon session here, I think. Uh, we were all provoked to think about what is what comes next. Uh, what's what is the next thing? How can we develop the smart city further? Um, we heard about the conscious city, the, the, the circular city, the, the city next. And I think that's partly because we might be frustrated with the definitions of the smart city. Everyone has a definition, yet everyone says that there is no definition. Um, they seem to be either too narrow and thus potentially technocratic or too wide and thus potentially uh, of little use. But what most conceptualizations, uh, I think we, we might all agree, share is that the goal is efficiency and, and, and in some way or another, the, the means is IT technology and the playing field is the city. And some might even confuse the goal and the means or some, some approaches uh, which can be problematic. But then generally the problem analysis of the smart city and we've heard an, an from almost everybody today. Uh, the problem analysis is, is very uh, plausible. Uh, cities are massive consumers of uh, material, um, material expensive, equally massive producers of GHG emissions. And I want to add that buildings, um, potentially even more so, buildings consume 40% of global material expense and produce 30% of annual GHG emissions. So, one of the first points, I want to make three points today. One of the first points I want to make today is that uh, to address this challenge, uh, coupled with how can we think the smart city a little further, let's say that a possible way to couple the ecosystemic efficiency that we seem to, to be after with profitability that we seem to all need is the notion of circularity. And the basis for such a statement is, is, is not a study is simply my day-to-day -day experience uh, at the operative level at an urban development project in Berlin called Das Ekla, which is part of a slightly larger project called Der Holzmann. Uh, some of you might have heard uh, of this project. I just want to give a brief introduction. Der Holzmarkt uh, is a prime example of bottom-up urbanism. To a great surprise of uh, the city of Berlin and of uh, investors that were after this land, a community of friends of an inf infamous techno club bought this piece of land. Uh, it was Bar 25. Uh, they had illegally occupied this land, um, first illegally and then temporarily, got chased away, um, and in 2012, on the last day of an official bidding process, they handed in the highest bid, um, offered the most money to buy this land. And now they're developing uh, a creative district there. And in the north, the northern part, there will be Das Ekwe. And uh, this is how it looks today. So you see the first, uh, first buildings coming up. And Das Ekwe will be a place, it will basically be a technology center and a student living um, uh, yeah, dorm, dormitory, um, where students and entrepreneurs can live and work affordably. But I, oh, and, and by the way, this will also be Germany's highest timber building, which, uh, which we're very excited about. But I don't want to um, advertise this project today. I just want to use the experience that we had with this project to illustrate and to maybe ground in reality uh, some of the uh, challenges that we have and, and some of the points that I want to make today. So the second point is that at ECVAC, we're realizing that the bottleneck to being smart, and we, we would like to be smart as a building, we would like to be smart as an urban neighborhood, is, is really the availability of the smart technology, as you can also see uh, you know, in Sebeck. But for us, it is the, the linearity of the uh, value chain in architecture, in real estate, and in urban development that all prevent us to use this technology. And to illustrate that, I would like to give you four examples. They might seem a little disjointed at first, but they make sense in the end. First example, um, this is the Greenpeace headquarter in Hamburg. So before we started planning the building, we took 
um, a look around and, and, and did a reference study, one of the buildings we visited was this Greenpeace headquarter in Hamburg. And I personally, I wasn't there, but I've heard the story over and over. I, this building is, isn't a bad building, um, but it also isn't a very progressive building. So certain technologies that uh, you might expect to see in there, such as LED lighting in a Greenpeace headquarter, are not to be found. And the reason for that was very simple. Greenpeace was a, a normal tenant, and the product developer who built it for them was after a quick sell. And LED technology, as other uh, smart and eco-effective technologies, have usually very high capital outlay costs. But refinance themselves later on during uh, during the use phase by saving uh, energy and thus uh, money. But the savings lie on the tenant side, not on the product developer side. Second example, those are the Allianz Towers. They're a few hundred meters down the river of where our project is. Their uh, technical building equipment in the towers is pretty outdated, which, I, which is normal for buildings of that age, but, and it needs an update. But it seems to be cheaper to demolish the building, which is what they're going to do, and to rebuild a similar project rather than to update the the software of the building, if you will. It's basically a, a phone, a huge smartphone. Um, third example, this is now the first time that, that, that we talk about it. Our project, we, we went through two years of development and realized that planners, technical building equipment planners, uh, as do architects and, and everyone else who plans a building, has a financial interest in over-equipping a building with technology or with with anything that, they, that they're responsible for planning. So after two years of planning, we had to stop uh, the process, um, put, had to put the architects on hold, the planners on hold, took a break and tried to understand whether the building that we had designed now was still in line with the founding ideas and principles of the project, which was, uh, amongst others, a low-tech approach. To, to be green, we wanted a low-tech approach. Um, so at some point, we had a building that had a full basement story simply reserved for technical building equipment to serve the other stories of our building. And uh, it took us half a year to replan this, um, to, 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 to now have, uh, arrive at, at, at this configuration of building, which is almost the same usable space, almost the same program, really insignificantly different, with half the space for technical building equipment. And the question was, why didn't the planner responsible to plan the technical building equipment, why didn't at least he propose this kind of option to us? And the answer is very simple. It's because his salary is a direct cut, a percentage cut of, uh, of the overall project volume. So he's not interested in, in, in anything that is a low-tech approach. I couldn't find a better image. Um, it is about energy. We, in our little district, we need energy. And... Um, we found an energy cooperative to produce that energy. But because we're all laymen, we need help. And we uh, co cooperated, partnered with a green energy provider. The name of uh, said provider is not important. But the reason, because, uh, the reason that the, this relationship between us and this green energy provider didn't last very long was simply because constantly we had uh, conflicts of interest that we realized we wanted to save as much energy as possible. The green energy provider wanted us to consume as much energy as possible, which sounds counterintuitive at first, but from a, log from a business uh, perspective, it, it logically makes sense. So even green technology, they want to produce more and more and more, uh, uh, green energy want to produce more and more and more energy. So what all of these, I think, examples share is the, the need for new business models that uh, go away from the linearity and, and, and capitalize on, on circularity. And circularity for us doesn't mean to reduce the lifespans of, of buildings. With new building materials such as timber, lifespans of buildings might even increase, and that's a good thing. But it means to decrease the lock-in risk, the technological lock-in risk of the building. And it also means to identify a way to recoup inhibitively high uh, capital outlay cost for those smart technologies. Because currently, Neither small and medium-sized enterprise producing those technologies find a way to put them to market, nor are developers incentivized to 
uh, move away from a conventional approach. And so this is the third point I want to make, and the third and last point I want to make today, that for us, just speaking from the experience of this project, the basis for those new business models to play out for us is a separation of technical building equipment from the building shell or the building envelope. You want to see those two things separate, as separate as you can, conceptually, physically, and economically. So we can't separate out all technology of a building, but we can separate out some. We can separate out the technology that has innovation potential and the technology that has neighborhood potential. And innovation potential simply means that a piece of technology has much shorter innovation cycles than the building has maintenance cycles, electrical installations, lighting, these kind of things. Neighborhood potential means, it's an economies of scale argument, refers to technology that can exploit clustering effects, heating, cooling, for us even fire protection serves more than, than one building. And so this separation has a, a couple of dimensions, Physic, uh, physical, economic, financially, and, and social. So physically, the separation is pretty simple. We, our technology is visible. You see pipes, you see cables, you see, uh, uh, nothing is hidden. Even the light uh, is a mobile lighting unit, so we don't have the light installed in the ceiling, but you can move it around. Uh, like a lamppost on the street we had seen before, but indoor. Um, for some, that might not be preferable, but it kind of adds to an industrial charm that this project was after anyway, so that works. But economically, the separation is most interesting. Because it means, for example, that a consortium of firms um, involved in all things electricity, just to give an example, not only plan the electrical installations for this building, but invest in them and then operate them. So that means that photovoltaic facades, for instance, taking in solar energy, might channel this into a DC network, into the cables, into the lights, and into smart monitoring without uh, and, 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 and what this means is that the tenant doesn't pay for a, commodity, uh, for a commodity anymore, for electricity, but for a service, for light. So the tenants of our building in the future, as an example, will pay for the service of light. Now, the more efficient this consortium of firms is, the, the more energy they save, the more profitable they will be. Financially, this separation for us is very beneficial because it lowers the cost of the building. Because there's certain cost for technology that simply is not borne by us anymore, but by a producer of the technology or by an investor. Um, for us, that's around 7 million euros that we need to spend less, which is very important if you want to afford a affordable, if you want to offer affordable space. You need your building to be as affordable as possible. For the tenant, nothing much changes. Admittedly, the, the rent he pays for including the bills is a bit higher because now our tenant will have to pay for not only light, but for fire protection every month, even for furniture. But the cold rent, the rent without bills, is lower because the building itself is cheaper. So in the end, for the tenant, that's the same. And then finally, there's a social dimension to this whole thing too, because with this separation, we kind of restructure and recast also the roles that we play as producer, consumer, and, and the tenant. So the technology producer that we cooperate with they now have to assume new roles as a service provider, which they're not used to, or even as an investor if they have the capacity. And the students who are gonna live, they also have to find their ways. They have to rebalance uh, their desire for uh, create uh, individual expression and, and, and being part of kind of an efficiency-driven framework. To take the example of light again, the students will not be able to choose the light bulb they use because the electricity consortium will predefine that, but they can still choose the lampshade that they put around the light. In summary, this is uh, one example of what we're trying to do at this ECRA. We're trying to identify how circular economic business models may allow us to use smart technology without us or the tenant having to pay more. And we're not doing this alone, we're doing this with a, a, a consortium of partners more than those, but with those partners, we just entered into a Horizon 2020 uh, call. And uh, we'll see what comes out of that. Thank you for your attention. So, Leila, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you.